Ah, good morning. It is good to be with you and with God's people this morning, right? Amen. Amen. Yeah, I feel God's presence here in this room, and I'm happy to be here because I, well, I do like you guys, but I really like my family, and I really like the beach. And so if I see you, it means I am on vacation, and I am a happy person. Uh, So I'm so excited to be here with you this morning and just share a little bit uh, from God's Word. Uh, And um, I, I will have to say, though, I'm not terribly excited about the topic that I got to talk to you about today. I mean, I got a text from Pastor Brian probably a month or more and uh, letting me know what I was going to be sharing when I hear. And he said, here's what you're going to talk about. You're going to talk about why doesn't God answer prayer? I was like, this does not sound like a fun talk, a t- topic to talk about on vacation. And then I chuckled to myself because the last three times I've had to speak at or had the opportunity to speak at another church, I've been given the following three topics. End times and the judgment seat of Christ... Angels, demons, and spiritual warfare, and now why doesn't God answer prayer? I'm like, God, are you like playing a joke on me? Like, what did I do wrong? But anyway, no, honestly, truthfully, this is a topic that I'm honored to talk about because the reality is I think probably every person in this room can relate to the topic at hand. Uh, If you believe in God whatsoever, chances are you've prayed and at times, God hasn't answered those prayers. And maybe they've been small things, like insignificant things, but maybe they've been really, really big things that you've prayed for, you've asked God for, and and it didn't, and God didn't come through in that moment in the way that you hoped he would or thought he would. And so so in reality, I think this is probably one of the most applicable topics to every person here in the room. Why didn't God answer my prayer? And I'm going to go ahead and tell you This could be the shortest sermon in the history of sermons because I'm going to tell you the punchline right now. I don't know. I don't know why God didn't answer my prayer or your prayer. We could put that on the screen, worship team, come back up and end this thing right now. I I, I mean, I really don't know. I mean, there are many times where like, we, we feel like we have done everything we know to do. We've prayed, we've fasted, like we've made bargains with God. You know what I'm talking about, people in the room. Like you've done all the, all the things, and the prayer still wasn't answered. And actually, I think we get ourselves into trouble when we try to answer questions for God like this, where we try to explain things that maybe he's the only one who actually holds the answer to. And we try to speak for God, and actually what happens a lot of times is people try to build whole theologies or worldviews around these kinds of things because of their disappointment or their pain. And so it's actually something that we, I think, really have to be careful with. Uh, And and even in my own life, I'll I'll tell you, in the last couple years, I've really dealt with this a lot. So um, uh, we had a friend of ours, his name's Ishmael, and uh, right towards the beginning of COVID, he got a really, really bad case of COVID. And actually, I know some of you in this room were actually uh, were, were instrumental in praying for, for his healing. And so he got really bad. It was in the hospital for over 75 days. Uh, they gave him a 3% chance or less of survival. The doctor said, it, it will be a miracle if he walks out of this hospital. And so we prayed and we contended and we fasted and we did everything we knew to do. We, pr- we, we really went after it. And Ishmael made a full recovery. Walked out of the hospital. It was incredible. It was celebration. He led people to Jesus in his hospital room. Like, they had him hooked up to this machine where it was transferring, like, oxygen and blood into his body. And he was, like, drawing all these parallels to what Jesus has done for us and giving us his blood. And it was this incredible story. All kinds of, even today, Ishmael's walking. He's preaching at our church next Sunday, which is just an amazing thing. It was so cool to see God answer that prayer. But also in the same year, I had a good friend of mine named Brian. Brian's 35 years old. And Brian, five years ago, we found out that he had a, a brain tumor. And they said, you probably have less than a 5% chance of survival. Usually it's about five years. And we prayed and we contended and we fasted for five years, praying that Brian would be healed of this thing. We, we prayed that he would be able to have a child because they didn't have a baby yet. And they prayed. And, and God blessed their family with a little baby. And in the middle of the pregnancy... They said, your cancer is getting worse, it's not going to get any better, and you're going to expect to have some decline in the next couple months. And on Christmas Eve of last year, Brian died. And I'm left with two close friends of mine, two family members in our church going, God, what was the difference? 
Why did you answer one prayer and not the other? We did all of the same things. I can see just as many reasons why God should have answered the one prayer and maybe not the other, but the reality is I don't know. I don't know. I say that not to be heavy, heavy-handed or, or uh, to make us think that God can't answer prayer because I've seen God do it over and over again, and you probably have too. Even in the last couple weeks of our church, we've had two people with absolute miracle healings of their knees. Like, a woman walked out of our church with a cane over her head marching recently. It's awesome. I've seen God do crazy things, but then I've also seen some unanswered prayers. And chances are, you have dealt with the, those kinds of confusion and those, that kind of pain. And it's especially hard when we're trying to help other people. So maybe it's not something for you, but you know someone who's dealt with the pain of an unanswered prayer. You're trying to figure out, how do I, what do I say? What do I do? And sometimes we feel the pressure to have to answer for God or to try to, try to give answers. And sometimes there just aren't adequate answers. So here's what I want us to to do today. We might not know why God doesn't answer each individual prayer, but there are some things we can know. And so we're going to focus on what we can know today, okay? So while here's some things we can know. We can know that there is a possibility of answered prayer, that there are some potential, potential, I'm saying, barriers to prayer, to answered prayer, and then there are some practical responses, that we can have. And we're just going to talk through these things today. And, and here's what I want to say. I, I, want, um, I, I want today to, do, to be, strike the right balance between uh, giving good information, biblical information, but also talking to your heart. And so there are times today where I might kind of go back and forth between kind of speaking to your heart and then just giving you some facts. And I'm just going to trust that the Holy Spirit is big enough and strong enough that he can know how to speak to your heart. Okay? I'm just going to pray and invite him to come. So Holy Spirit, I just invite you to be here. You're already here. Your presence and your power is here. God, as we sung the songs of worship and praise and affirmed who you are and who we are in you, God, I have no doubt that you are among these people. God, you desire to say something. So I pray today that only what's from you would stick and everything else would just go. Let your word be true today. Let it change us in your name. Amen. So first, let's talk a little bit about the possibility of answered prayer, the possibility of answered prayer. So the very fact that you're even discussing why God didn't answer a prayer kind of reveals that we assume that God can answer prayer, right? It would be silly for us to talk about why it doesn't happen if we don't believe that it, that it does. And so let me just give a couple key texts in the, from the life of Jesus in the Gospels where he talks about prayer. So Matthew chapter 7, uh, verse uh, 7 through 11. Here's what Jesus says about prayer. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, I like how Jesus is like, you're not pulling any punches here, know how to give any good, give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? And then another place in the Gospel of John, Jesus is talking to his disciples in a, in a small room and, and discussing things right before he's about to go to his death. And he tells them this, John, John 14, 12 through 13. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I'm going to my Father. And, whatever, <clears throat> and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. I love these statements of Jesus because Jesus isn't trying to unpack the what and the why of prayer. He's just assuming that God answers prayer. And he puts it so simply and so plainly that I think he wants us to take things at face value and, and believe his word that he's saying, like, no, God does answer prayer. My Father in heaven answer prayer. They're like so simple and they're so bold. Uh, it, it seems as if he's trying to say God does want to answer prayer. And I think God does. And here's what I would say. For Jesus, the possibility for answered prayer is rooted in the character and the plans of God. The possibility for answered prayer is rooted in the character and the plans of God. Let me break that down, just some of these statements that Jesus makes. Here's here's the first thing I think Jesus would say, that God is good and all-powerful, that God is good 
and all-powerful. If not, then it seems silly to pray. Because if God isn't good, why would we ask God to do good things? And so Jesus' assumption, as he says here to his disciples, like, no, my Father in heaven, he's really, really good. You even know how to give good gifts to your, to your sons and daughters. How much more in the Father is the Father in heaven even better than you? So his assumption is the Father is good, and his assumption is God can do anything we ask. And so on that foundation, we know that we can go to God in prayer because he's good, and he knows how to give good gifts to his kids, and because he can do anything we can ask. I love how the Apostle Paul, he like fleshes this out a little bit more in Ephesians. He says, he can do far above whatever we can ask, think, or imagine. I have a pretty big imagination. God is able to do more than that, and Jesus lives with that assumption and wants us to have that too. Secondly, God wants to answer prayers that bring him glory and are for our good. God wants to answer prayer. It's, it's, his, it's in his heart. It's, it delights his heart to answer prayer. Things that give him glory, pe- the, that, uh, things that, that show his value and his worth. And that are for our good because he loves us as his sons and daughters. So he loves to do these kinds of things. Things that will show the world who he really is and things that will really benefit us. The challenge is we don't always know what will bring God glory and what will be for our good, right? And so that can be confusing sometimes. We don't understand what, what will really give God glory or what will be God. But Jesus makes this assumption. This is, this is how God is. And the third thing is, I think this kind of the possibility for answer prayer is rooted in this, that God desires human partnership in prayer to bring about his will on earth. God desires human partnership in prayer uh, to bring about his will on earth. God doesn't need us, but for some reason assumes that we're supposed to be a part of his plan and what he does on earth. Actually, you will be hard-pressed to look through the pages of the Bible and to find times where God doesn't work through a human being in some way. In almost every story, God chooses human partnership. And right going back all the way to the beginning, God has chosen to work through prayer. So think about Abraham interceding for the people in the story of the Bible. Think about Moses interceding and praying, God, don't destroy your people. And God relents and doesn't do it. We think about all these stories in the Bible where God uses the prayer of his people to bring about his will on earth. He doesn't need us. But he wants us. And so all of this is an invitation for us to step into prayer. And my guess is for most of you, I'm kind of preaching to the choir. You believe these things. You believe that these things are true. And so you know that God can answer prayer. But the question is, if all of those things are true, then why doesn't it happen sometimes? Because I think we all, right, we all believe those things are true. My guess is if we did a poll in the room, you'd say, yeah, I believe God is good. I believe God is all-powerful. I believe God wants to do things that give him glory and are for our good. And I believe God wants to partner us for prayer, but but sometimes it doesn't happen, so why? So let's talk about a few potential barriers to answered prayers. And again, here's, I want to say this, I'm going to say it again. I think it's best for us to be very, very careful here and to not give too many answers in specific situations about why God doesn't answer prayer. Because it's, um, we, we often are t- trying to reach for the mind of God and things that we just don't quite understand. And we're doing the best we can, but it's not as if there aren't some things we can't know. There are some things that the scripture says, yeah, here's an instance, here's a, here's a chance where we might want to think about why a prayer wasn't answered. And so I want to give you these things, but I want to give, uh, give you them with a caveat. I want you to be careful to not create a checklist today of reasons why God didn't answer my prayer, okay? Can we make this deal with one another? Uh, uh, So don't make this a checklist. Don't make this a formula or an algorithm. If I do all these things right, then if I do X and Y, I will get Z. So don't do that. But these categories might help us think a little bit about how we can adopt a different posture in prayer. How God can use prayer in our life to examine our own hearts and draw us closer to him. How in pursuing something in prayer, how God might be forming us to be more in the image of Jesus, which, by the way, is more his priority anyway. Uh, And so at the end of the day, we're going to give some of these answers, but we're going to have to learn to trust God with some of these things. Okay, ready? So here's a few possible barriers to prayer. First one, 
we don't ask, duh, and we ask with wrong motives sometimes. James, the brother of Jesus, writes about this in James chapter 4, verses 2 through 3. He says, look, you don't have because you don't ask, and when you do ask, you ask with wrong motives. And it seems so simple that like, uh, we, we would assume that we would be praying for things, but let me ask you this question. How many times uh, have you just worried about something instead of actually praying about something? I do this all the time, and I'm like, God, why didn't you answer my prayer? He's like, well, did you talk to me about it, or did you just worry about it, Jail? And I realized, no, I actually didn't pray. I just worried. I, I don't, I, when I encounter a problem, my go-to, I wish I could tell you I was more spiritual and pastoral, and my go-to would be like, get on my knees and pray and ask God. No, we got some bad news recently about like a car repair, and my th- first thing was like, okay, how do I get the money? How do I solve the problem, right? Like, we, and we all do that. And then I wonder, like, so how many prayers have gone unanswered because they didn't ask, because they just worried about it, right? And then there are some times where we pray, but we pray with the wrong motives. So anyone ever pray to get out of a speeding ticket? Yeah? Uh-huh. Pray to pass the test that you didn't study for, right? God's gracious and kind and sometimes does these things, like, but, but the motives are slightly off. And then there are other things like pray for a bigger house or a nicer car, and like, it's not that those things are bad, but are our motives right in that? Like, and so James invites us when we pray to one, make sure we ask, and two, to check our motives. So that's one possible barrier. A second possible barrier is this, that we're asking for something that won't give God glory or won't be for our good. And the, and the truth is, sometimes we just don't know that. A lot of times we go to God and we're asking for him to do something, and we, we think we know the solution. We think we have the answer worked out in our minds. God, if you would just do this, I know it would give you glory. And I, God, I just know it would be for my good, but in reality, it's not always the case. And so uh, what does the great theologian Garth Brooks, the country singer, say about this? Some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. Like, you, we didn't know what we needed. Like, and so, so God doesn't answer the prayer. I think about the story of Jesus and Lazarus. Remember the story? Lazarus is a friend of Jesus, and Lazarus is on a sickbed. And his, and his sisters send word to Jesus that he would uh, come and pray because he knows that Jesus has the ability to heal him. And Jesus doesn't hurry and doesn't go, and Lazarus dies. In the middle of that story, what Jesus talks about is like, this has happened so that my father will get glory here. Now, there could have been a lot of glory and a lot of good for Lazarus to not have been sick in the first place and for God to answer that prayer. But actually, if you read the Gospel of John, it's this story of the resurrection of Lazarus that is the catalyst for everything that happens in the second half of the book. So the thing that gives God glory is not just the healing of a physical sickness, but the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead. What a great story. It's a great story to be healed. It's a better story to come back to life, right? Right? And we think we know how the stories end and the best ending of the story, but we don't. I'll give you an example of this. I've got a friend named Jason. <clears throat> Jason is probably um, one of the top tennis athletes in the world, uh, at, could compete at an Olympic level. He's also the coach of an NFL franchise uh, football team. He has a multi million dollar real estate business. Uh, he is also the head of an organization that helps athletes all over the world, but specifically in the Midwest, the Great Lakes region. The thing about Jason, though, and all of those things, is Jason is severely disabled. Because about 20 years ago, he fell from a ladder and had severe spinal injuries, as well as broke many, many bones in his body. And then on top of that, uh, he got a number of infections over the course of his many surgery. I think he's had like 70 to 80 surgeries over the course of this time. Most, a lot of his body is metal, uh, and, and, and he's in immense pain all the time. And went through all that course of, of uh, being in the hospital and having all these surgeries, Jason prayed for healing. God, take this away from me. Heal me. Get, get me well again. But Jason is still basically wheelchair-bound, can't get himself around. But somewhere along the way, he kind of resigned to the fact, I think I've prayed as many prayers as I can, everybody's prayed for me, all the prayers they can for my healing. And God, if you want to heal me, then I'll open myself up to it. But the thing I want, God, is don't waste this in my life. 
Don't waste this. Let this be used for, my, for your glory. And something happened in Jason's life when he submitted that prayer to God. And all of a sudden, all the things that Jason was pretty good at pre-accident, all of a sudden, Jason became really good at. So Jason's one of the top wheelchair tennis athletes in the world. He's the head coach of a wheelchair football team. He's the head coach of GLASA, which is the Great Lakes Association of Disabled Sports Athletes in our area. And he uses that platform to share about the love and grace of Jesus and how you can overcome. He has had incredible ministry with all sorts of veterans and people who have come back disabled. And I asked him the other, I said, Jason, if you had it to do all over again, would you want God to heal you like you were praying for in the beginning? He said, no. I would never have had these opportunities I have today. I never would have seen my life matter the way it matters today if that had happened. Now, that might not be your story. I have plenty of other people in that same, in that same situation who are still praying and contending for healing, but in his life, this was the thing that gave God glory and was for his good. The third thing, sometimes it's about not having enough faith. Either ours as the people praying or the people we're praying for. Mark chapter 6 is a scary chapter in the Gospels. Jesus goes to his hometown. This miracle worker does incredible things everywhere else. But when he goes to his hometown of Nazareth, it says he was not able to do many miracles there because of the lack of faith. That's like frightening. I pray all the time for our church community at home back in Illinois, like, God, don't let us be like that. I want to be a community of much faith. I don't want your hands to be limited because of our lack of faith. Jesus later tells his disciples when they've been trying to cast out a demon and, and heal a young man that, that it, like, it's their lack of faith. They needed to actually pray and fast even more. There's, there are these times where it seems like faith matters. Somehow, faith is a factor. The challenge is we don't always know how and why. I have been times where I prayed for people to be healed of different things or prayed for specific things. I felt like I had mountains of faith, not just a mustard seed. And it didn't happen. And there are times where I feel like I had little to no faith at all, and I've seen a person get up and walk out of a chair who wasn't able to walk before. I was like, I don't understand how this works, God. But it seems as though Jesus thinks that faith matters. We just don't always know how. And so I think we have to, again, in this area, tread really, really lightly, especially if we're talking to other people and not telling them, uh, you just didn't have enough faith. That's a, that's a big no-no. Like, if you want to get on my pastoral bad side, that's the way to do it. Tell someone they didn't have enough faith. The reality is only God knows. And, but it's worth examining God. Did I have enough faith here? And I will tell you that, that since I have been examining myself by this question, I feel like my faith is rising. And I've been specifically asking God, give me more faith, Lord. Help me believe for the impossible. Help me believe that you can do things that are above whatever. And I feel like my faith is rising. But we have to be careful with this. The fourth thing, sometimes sin or disobedience might be a reason for there being an, an, an unanswered prayer. Again, we have to be really careful with this too because there are, there's a time where the disciples come to Jesus and they have, a, they have a man who's born blind and they ask Jesus, why is this person blind? Was it his fault or his parents' fault? Was it his sin or his parents' sin? And Jesus says, neither. Doesn't have anything to do with it. But then there are other times where Jesus invites us into something and clearly our participation and listening to his word matters. So imagine for the second uh, that Jesus asked you to take up your mat and walk, and you refused to do so, right? It, you hearing his voice and responding to what he says does matter. I think about this like with, with, my, with my own kids. Like, uh, they're, um, if they come to me and are like, Dad, could you do, would you, you know, whatever it is, take us to ice cream, because my kids love ice cream, like, and they know I'm likely to say yes, you know. Uh, the, so they'll come to me and ask me these kinds of things. And a lot of times, my first question will be, well, did you do what I asked you to do earlier? Like, I asked you to go clean your room, so if I go to look inside your room, would you, like, w is that done? A lot of times they'll be like, okay, they don't say anything. They go back up quietly and clean the room, and then come back down later, right? So the, our uh, posture of heeding God's word and listening to him matters in our life. However, there have been plenty of times in my own life and the stories of other people where I know I had sinned, 
and God still answered the prayer. Because prayers are answered prayers are answered on the basis of God's character and not ours. Okay? I want you to hear that. Answered prayers are answered on the basis of God's character and not ours. That said, we should be attentive and we should occasionally ask the question, God, is there unconfessed sin in my life? Is there something I haven't like listened to you about recently that, that you've asked me to do? Like Those are questions worth examining, but they're not worth projecting onto other people. And they're not worth sending us into the tank. Because in these instances, it's willful disobedience against God, not accidental things that we don't know about. Make sense? Another one, conflict and unforgiveness. First Peter chapter 3 and, uh, talks about, this is a funny one, where uh, Peter's appealing to husbands. He says, husbands, you better make things right with your wives. I'm paraphrasing here before you go to prayer, so that your prayers will be heard. By the way, I think that applies to wives too, so you're not getting off the hook, ladies. And then Matthew and Jesus, when he's talking to his disciples in the Sermon of the Mount, he tells them, look, if you have conflict with somebody and you go to the altar and you're offering uh, your, your worship, your act of offering, and you realize you had conflict with something, somebody, leave the altar and go and make it right with that person and then come back. It matters to the heart of God that our relationships with one another are good when we approach him with our requests. And again, I get this as a dad, because if one of my kids harms my other kid, right, and then they come to me and ask me for something, I'll never withhold something they really need. Same thing with disobedience, by the way. I'll never withhold something they really need. But if I know that they're in conflict with their sister, a lot of times I'll say is, why don't you go and make that right, and then come back and talk to me. Because for me, it's actually dishonoring to me as their dad when they dishonor one another. Does that make sense? And so then to come to me and ask for something feels like, you don't love like I love your sister. And so part of this process is like, I want you to go and make it right. And again, we have to be careful to not assign this to ourselves or to other people, but it's worth asking the question, do I have any un uh, conflict or unforgiveness? The last thing I'll say about this, last barrier, and there are many more. The last one could be a lack of persistence or giving up too soon. Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 in that verse I read where he says, ask, seek, and knock. In the original uh, language in Greek, it actually says, keep on asking, keep on knocking, keep on seeking. These are continuous things, not one-time things. They're things we're meant to continue to do over and over again. As a matter of fact, while Jesus often talks about the simplicity of prayer, oftentimes he talks about our need for persistence in prayer. In Luke chapter 18, when Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray and gives them the Lord's Prayer, it says, it says in Luke that he, he told them how to pray and that they should not give up. They shouldn't give up in prayer. And we can, I can think of story after story where persistence in prayer really matters. You know, I don't know why our friend Ishmael didn't come home on day one in the hospital. But I wonder what would have happened had we given up praying on day one. Instead, he came home on day 75. And I wonder about how many things in my life maybe I haven't seen through to the end because I gave up praying too soon. There are things right now in my life I've been praying for a while. And there are things in my life right now that I know that are the product of people praying for me for a long time. And the same is true of you. So persistence in prayer. I, I don't want to ever get to heaven and say, God, like, what was the deal with that? He said, you just, you gave up too soon. You gave up too soon. So you can do all these things and still sometimes not have answered to prayer. That's why I'm saying don't use this like a checklist. Don't use this like a formula. Because you could go through this list and say, hey, right now, I'm praying for X. And I think I've just run through that whole list, and I don't have any unforgiveness. I'm not living in sin. I feel like I'm pursuing God's glory. I feel like I've done all those things, and I'm still not getting the answer to the prayer. Which is why I'm saying we have to be so careful with this. And so here's what I would say. It's okay to seek God and ask for clarity. Let me give you just a couple practical responses to close. It's okay to seek clarity, but in the reality, in following Jesus, there are just going to be some things we're going to have to be okay with not having an answer to. 
That's really hard in a world that feels like they have answers for everything, right? If there's anything I want to figure out, I can go on YouTube right now and figure it out. How do I fix this? How do I do this? There's some life hack for this. Like, that, it doesn't work that way with prayer. There's no hack for prayer. This is communion with the living God who sees eternity that you don't see, who sees what you need right now more than you know what you need right now. And so one thing I would just say from, this, from, from the outset with this is like, we need to be seeking the one who answers prayer more than the answers to prayer. We need to be seeking the one who answers prayer more than the answer to prayer. In my life, what I have seen is God do incredible things in my own heart. Peace, freedom, joy, love, kindness, the fruit of the Holy Spirit produced in my life. I'm not saying that to boast or anything like that, but saying those things have been produced as God has reoriented my attention from the answer that I was seeking to seeking him. And so at the end of it, if I'm more like Jesus and I didn't get the answer to prayer, I'm okay with that. What I want is to be more like Jesus and get the answer to prayer. (laughs) How about you? (laughs) Right? But we've got to make sure we have the right priorities. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So are you seeking the answer to prayer, or are you seeking the one who answers prayer? When our prayers do go unanswered, it's okay to ask for clarity, but we've got to be okay A lot of times they're just going to be, we just don't know. It's okay to share your pain with God. Read the Psalms. They're full of people saying, God, where are you in this moment? Where are you? Come through here. And and that's okay. Actually, the Psalms are my favorite for that because I've wrestled with God about some stuff. And the Psalms are a really good resource for you to share your pain. God, I don't understand this. I'd say seek godly counsel. When you're in a moment where you feel like you've prayed for something and your prayer's gone unanswered, do not go through that alone. But seek out godly counsel, people who love Jesus and love you. Because a lot of times that disappointment with answered prayer when we sit and we fester it alone can actually be really, really harmful to ourselves, to us. And so we, we don't want to sit in that disappointment alone. Don't go to Google, don't go to social media. Don't go to friends who don't know God. Seek other believers who love God and love you, who know God's word. and Say, hey, would you sit with me in this? I don't know what's happening here. Would you pray with me? Would you just listen to me? Search your own heart barriers. So while while I say don't use those things as a checklist, it's worthwhile to say, God, I'm not sure but if there's something in my life that doesn't measure up, something in me, God, that, that, that like you're wanting to work on, God, I just open myself bare before you right now and do it. God, search me if there's any wicked way in me. God loves that humble posture in your heart. He doesn't want you to beat yourself up with that. And he doesn't want you to do that to manipulate anything. And then if there's anything there, confess it. Bring it to God. Bring it to his throne of grace. Don't beat yourself up and say, oh, I've got to fix this. I've got to get this right. No, Jesus made it right already. You can boldly go before the throne of God with your requests. We get to march right into his presence. But it's worth asking God and bringing to him anything we know. And then keep on asking, keep on seeking, and keep on knocking. We have a phrase I've learned from a mentor we use around our church that we keep praying until Jesus comes back, until we hear a clear no or we get the answer that we want. Those are the only three reasons why we stop praying for something. We've got a conviction. Until Jesus comes back, we hear a clear no or we get the answer that we're seeking. And lastly, just a few other things. When other people's prayers go unanswered, because maybe it's not about you this morning, Don't give answers that you don't know and don't speculate. It's better to say nothing and not be like Job's friends. Job's friends try to explain away the hardship that's happening in Job's life and they have no idea what they're talking about. And they create more pain and hurt. (laughs) So don't do that. Instead, just be with the person. Ask them what they need from you. And what they might need from you is for you to come around them and continue to pray with them or pray for them when they're not around. Maybe that's the thing that they need you to do. 
As a matter of fact, there's going to be some words of the song they're going to sing in just a second that I think are perfect for us to think about. How does God, how do, what do I do with my pain and unanswered prayer? But then also, how do I help someone else in, with an unanswered prayer? So keep on praying for that person in need. And lastly, just be present with people and listen to them. Listen to their pain, listen to their frustration, listen to their disappointment. I've seen God do more healing work as a pastor sitting and saying nothing than I have giving all the advice in the world. As a pastor, there are often times where I feel like I have to have the pressure to I have to explain this situation to someone. But sitting around with my arm around someone, crying with them and weeping in their, their pain is a gift to me and to them. So I want you to listen to the words of these song, this song today and just let God work in your heart whatever he wants to work right now.